Good morning, Year 4, and welcome to what I think will probably be our last instalment of our book, Alone on a Wide, Wide Sea. Okay, let's get straight into it, shall we? London Bridge is falling down. It was a good thing I was so buoyed up now and so determined, because in those last couple of thousand miles, just about everything that could go wrong did go wrong. First of all, North Atlantic turned out to be every bit as vicious and as hostile as the Southern Ocean. Kitty 4 took a terrible battering, and it wasn't just one storm, it was a whole succession of storms. We'd sail out of one and straight into another. We got knocked down three times in three days, and the last time we were very nearly and the last time was very nearly the end of the story. Not many single-handed sailors go over the sides and live to tell a tale. I did. It was all my own fault that it happened. As Dad used to say, I was a silly chump. I was in the cockpit in a storm and I wasn't harnessed in properly. Yes, I was tired. I hadn't slept for a couple of days, but that's no excuse. I was just a chump and I was very nearly a dead chump. I was caught completely unawares when the wave came. As the boat lurched violently, I was capitulated overboard. Somehow I managed to grab a safety wire and just clung onto it. But Kitty Four was on her side and I was dunked into the ocean. I remember hearing the roar of the sea in my ears and I knew that was always the last sound of a drowning sailor ever hears. Then Kitty Four righted herself. She flipped up and I found myself flung back into the cockpit, still in one piece, just but I was nursing a broken arm. I knew it was broken at once because I was completely useless and I was, I was cursing myself loudly. You're a lucky chump, a very lucky chump, I thought, when I'd stopped my cursing. My survival was down to Dad's key. I had no doubt about it. It was entirely down to Dad's lucky key. I didn't feel any pain in my arm at first. It was too cold after my dunking in the freezing waters of the North Atlantic. But when I dried, up, dried off and warmed up down below in the cabin, it began to hurt. I knew I'd need help, so I picked up the sat phone and rang home. Grandpa answered. I told him all I needed was a doctor to tell me what to do, and I'd manage. No arguments, Grandpa said. He was going to have me airlifted off. You can't sail a boat with a broken arm, he told me. I don't think I'd ever shouted at Grandpa before, or ever since, but I did now. I told him we were only 50 miles or so off the coast of England, off the Scilly Isles, which was less than 100 miles from Falmouth. The Kitty Four and I were going to finish this thing together, and I'd never speak to, and I'd never speak to him again if he got me airlifted off. Mum and Grandpa had a little talk about it, and five minutes later, I had Dr. Topolsky on the phone. It turned out he was a doctor of medicine as well, as a doctor of physics and engineering, and just about a doctor of everything else. He examined me by asking me dozens of questions, then he talked me through how to make a splint, how to bandage it to my arm. Not easy one-handed, but I managed to do it. Of course, it wasn't just me that was beaten up and hurting, it was Kitty Four too. Not the boat herself, she was fine. She just rocked and rolled and bobbed up and down again like she always did. She'd been built into to be an indestructible and unsinkable, and she was. It was all the bits and pieces that were beginning to fail, as we neared in the English Channel. Neither the generator nor the desalinator was reliable anymore. The self-steering was in pieces. I tried mending it, but with one arm I couldn't do it, so it meant I had to be up there in the cockpit almost all the time. In fact, I'd have to be there anyway, because there was a lot of shipping about now, more than I'd had on the whole of the trip put together. And for a little yacht, well, for any yacht, this was dangerous. I could see them. But in seas like this, I'd be lucky if they saw me before they ran me down. I didn't tell anyone how bad things really were getting. I knew Grandpa would react, how upset Mum would be. Instead, I wrote chirpy emails sounding deliberately upbeat and jokey on the sat phone. I think maybe that having to sound chirpy was very good for me. The truth was, I was now really worried that I might not be able to make it. My arm pained me every time I moved. Every sail change I made was sheer agony. I came to a decision. I emailed home saying I'd put into Scilly and not go on to Falmouth. After all, Scilly was England. It was as good a port as any to end the first half of my voyage. Mum phoned me back. 
She said that she and Grandpa had thought about it and they were flying over to England as soon as possible and they would let me know when, when they'd landed. I said I didn't want any fuss and they weren't to tell anyone what had happened. I was already dreading a welcoming flotilla coming out to meet me. Grandpa said that even with no website up there, uh, sorry, yeah, with no website up there, there was huge interest in the papers everywhere. Just don't tell them I'm coming into Silly, I told him. Promise me, Grandpa. He promised, but I wasn't convinced. I knew the temptation of having Stavros boats on the television news in big letters, and his little alley, the apple of his Greek eye, standing on deck and waving would be too much to resist. To be honest, I expected the worst. But I'd come to terms with it. Maybe it would be quite fun anyway. And even if I didn't like it, I could stand back and smile through gritted teeth. After all, I'd done it before in Hobart. <laughs> so there we were the next day, tootling along with a bit of a limp, but happy as Larry. I do sound like Dad sometimes, I know. But I love these phrases that are used. I inherited them. They're mine now. <clears throat> all the storms were behind us. The forecast was set fair all the way to Silly. Sunshiny days, clear skies, not a sign of a welcoming fl flotilla. Amazing. Grandpa, Grandpa had kept quiet. I had just sighted land. Not much land, but land all the same. And it was the land I wanted to see. The Silly Isles. I toasted the occasion with a mug of hot chocolate. The Sillies looked like grey dumplings lying low in the sea, about ten miles off. We were going nicely, about five knots. It was early morning. I was so nearly there. I'd seen a whale or perhaps a basking shark in the distance in the day before, and I was looking out for him again. What I saw instead was a school of poor poises playing off my starboard bow, giving me quite a show. This was quite an unexpected and spontaneous welcome that I really wanted. But I was enjoying it so much, I wasn't keeping a good lookout all around. That was when a sickening shudder shook the boat. She reared up and rolled, and then crashed down into the sea where she stopped dead, as if the life had suddenly gone out of her. The tiller was light in my hand, so I knew at once that we'd lost the rudder. Then I saw pieces of it floating astern of us. I thought at first we must have hit the whale, but we hadn't. The dark shape I saw lurking just beneath the surface rose and it showed itself again. It was a dirty orange with flat sides and sharp edges. A container. A lousy, stinking container. I cursed that the container ship wherever she was then i cursed all the container ships wherever they were cursing over i checked below at least we weren't hauled we hadn't lost buoyancy we were rudderless and helpless but still afloat <clears throat> i hoped we could drift on the tide at first but a quick look at my chart confirmed what i already knew that there were rocks all around silly thousands and thousands of them i had no choice I used the sat phone and called out the lifeboat. Within half an hour they were alongside and threw me a line. So with a busted rudder and a busted arm, I arrived on the Silly Isles, came into St Mary's Harbour, towed by the lifeboat. Because of that, of course, there was a lot of interest and very soon they found out who I was. No flotilla, thank goodness, but any hope I might have had of slipping in unnoticed was gone. They whisked me up to the hospital to have my arm looked at and told me I had to stay there the night, but I said I didn't want to. I'd have, <clears throat> I'd had a better offer. Matt Pender, the lifeboat, the lifeboat, <clears throat> the lifeboat driver, said he could put me up at home with his family. So after my arm was set and plastered, he came to fetch me, and we went straight to a pub, where they toasted me as if I was Ellen MacArthur, proper little hero they called me. Everyone made a fuss of me and I loved it. I tried phoning home but no one answered. They'd probably left already. I didn't mind. I was so happy to have got to England. So happy that the boat was in one piece just about. I did some TV and radio interviews the next day. Got them over with. Then I went down to the jetty to tidy Kitty 4 before she went off for repairs. There were crowds all around her. Dozens of people photographing her. And she was just bobbing up and down loving it all. Taking her bows. I waited about until everyone had gone before I went on board. Then we had quiet time together. Just Kitty Four and me. I emailed Mum, emailed Dr Topolsky, told everyone the repairs would take a couple of weeks at least. Then I would catch the ferry the following day from Scilly to Penzance and then the night train to London Paddington, getting in at 7 o'clock on the Wednesday morning. 
If they were there by then, they could meet me, and we could all go off to Bermondsey and start looking for Kitty right away. I told them something else too, something I knew neither of them would want to hear. I decided that once Kitty 4 was repaired, once my own was better, I would be sailing Kitty 4 home. I'd do the whole thing just as I planned, the whole circumnavigation, and nothing anyone could say would stop me. I meant it. Uh, Grandpa, I wrote, before I left Kitty 4, I got an email back. Whatever you say, Ali. See you at Paddington, 7am, Wednesday morning. There's a big clock there on the platform. Meet you there. Love, Mum and Grandpa. They'd given in just like that. I couldn't believe it. Matt and the whole lifeboat crew came to see me off on the ferry to Penzance. I'd never been hugged so much in all my life. I liked it. I liked it a lot. I had to wait around a while until I could get on the night train for London, so I was quite tired by the time I got into my seat. I was getting out my laptop. I wanted to send another email to Mum. When I looked up, there was this bloke sitting opposite smiling at me. We got talking, as you do. His name was Michael McCluskey. The rest of it you know already. Well, just about all of it anyway. What you don't know is what happened when I'd finished telling him my story and when we got into Paddington Station the next morning. The train came into Platform 1 and we got out together, Michael carrying my rucksack as well as his. He wasn't just good looking, he was thoughtful too. Still is, mostly. I could see Mum and Grandpa under the clock waiting. They looked around for me. That them? Michael asked. That's them, I said. So it's true. All of it. Everything you told me. Nothing made up. None of it. Then, he said, looking straight at me. I mean in every word, he said. Then you are the most incredible person I have ever met. And I'd like to see you again, if that's all right. I don't know what... I don't know to this day what made me say it. Look, I said, I'm hungry. Why don't you come and have breakfast with us, with mum and grandpa and me? He didn't say no, which was why after mum and grandpa had hugged hugged me and again and again, and after we'd all cried and laughed, Cretan style, under the clock at Paddington, we all piled into a taxi and went off to their hotel for breakfast. They seemed, I thought, a little bit nervous. Grandpa kept looking away wherever I caught his eye. I thought he was cross with me because I had insisted on doing the whole circumnavigation. He'd always been so much against it. Mum couldn't seem to find her voice at all. She just sat there patting me fondly. I exchanged glances with Michael, who shrugged with his eyes as only he could do. It was one of those huge modern hotels made entirely of glass and was right over the river. We walked into the breakfast room which was full of laid up tables, all of them empty except for a large round table near the window. Sitting around it, we all looked like a family with a couple of kids. All of them were looking at me very intently, which was odd, I thought. And Mum and Grandpa weren't leading us to one of the empty tables as I expected they would. Instead, they were leading us directly towards the round one by the window. And this, Mum said to them, not trying to disguise the pride in her voice, this is Ali, my daughter Ali, Arthur's daughter Ali. Still they stared, and then, one by one, the stares turned to smiles. I think you'd better introduce yourselves, Mum went on. Shall I start? I knew who he was before he opened his mouth. I recognised him from the photograph. I'm Mark, Mark Topolsky, from there, remember? And this is my family, Marianne, Molly and Martha, known in the neighbourhood, back home in Vermont, as the M&Ms. I couldn't speak, partly because I was so choked up, but there was another reason too. Even as he was talking, I was looking at the old lady sitting next to him. Her smile was dad's smile, from the eyes, from the heart. And I am Kitty, she said, your dad's sister. She could hardly speak either, but smiled through her tears. You got Arthur's key, dear? She said, the one I gave him. I took it off from around my neck and gave it to her. There was a small wooden box on the table in front of her, carved and painted with red and white flowers. She turned the key in the lock. It fitted. She smiled up at me again. She turned it and then she went on turning it again and again, which seemed strange. 
Then she opened the lid and I understood everything. The box played music. It was a musical box and the tune it played was London Bridges Falling Down. We listened until it slowed right down and then it finished mid-tune. And that, said the old lady, pointing out at the river, and I notice now that she too had a kind of American accent. That is London Bridge and it isn't falling down. I was born just down there in Bermondsey. It's where your dad was born too. My mother and father were killed in the bombing raid in the war. This musical box was all that was left of our home. We were in the same orphanage together, Arthur and me. We loved listening to this over and over. We'd listened to it for hours. Then they took your dad away. I gave him the key and told him I wouldn't play our tune again until he brought the key back. Then I would wind it up for him and we would listen to it together. I was the eldest, you see. I always did the winding up. I've never heard it again until today. It's yours now, Ali. And if you have children one day, then maybe you'll pass it on to them and you'll tell them the story of how in the end, the key found the music box and the musical box found the key. I was still unable to make sense of it all. But how did they find you? I asked, I don't understand. That was your astronaut friend here, said my Auntie Kitty. He went on television in the US when he came down from space travels and told the whole world about you, this amazing 18 year old girl from Australia called Ali Hobhouse, sailing single-handedly around the world on a little boat called Kitty Four, sailing all the way to England to find her father, her long lost sister, to fulfill a promise she'd made to her father on his deathbed. The father, he said, was called Arthur Hobhouse. His sister, Kitty Hobhouse. Anyone who could help, phone in. So I did. You see, when they set off, sorry, when they sent your dad off to Australia all of years ago, a lifetime ago, they sent me to Canada. I got lucky. I landed up with a lovely family uh, in Niagara-on-the-Lake. I lived there still right by the shore in the same house I was brought up in. You must come and see it sometime. I noticed a copy of Dad's story in front of her, right by her bowl of cornflakes. Have you read it yet? I asked. I've only just got it, she said. Trouble is, my eyes aren't very good at reading anymore. Maybe you could read it to me after breakfast. So that's what I did. An hour or so later, I read it to them, sitting there overlooking London Bridge and the Thames. The story of Arthur Hobhouse, I began. Arthur Hobhouse is a happening. I should begin at the beginning, I know that. But the trouble is, I don't know the beginning. I wish I did. Now you've read the book, I want you to know something. The two stories we wrote were never intended to be published. We each of us wrote our own story simply as a record of what happened. First to my father, Arthur Hobhouse, and then to me. I thought long and hard about whether to publish. This is, after all, a family story. How much you tell the word about your family is a delicate matter for everyone concerned. But the family is happy about it as I am, because our stories, Dad's and mine, had already been acted out in public, to some extent at least. And certainly, had this not happened, our story could not possibly have ended as well as it did. In other words, our private family story was never totally private in the first place. It was in the newspapers, on the radio, on television, but the whole of our story has never been fully told. And that's why I thought, and why we all thought that it should be. Dad would have wanted it, I know, because he believed that we live on only as long as our story continues to be told. And I believe that too. There we go. A book completed, Alone on the Wide, Wide Sea by Michael Morpurgo. So that came from a pack of Michael Morpurgo books that I have in my house. <clears throat> and I'm going to introduce three others to you. And what I want you to do is reply to this video and I'll look on all the comments 4F, 4Y, 4J. 
and see which one you prefer. So your first choice is Michael Morpurgo, Shadow. I'll read you the blurb for Shadow. <clears throat> Never has a man needed a friend more than when a springer spaniel appears in the mouth of his Afghan cave. The dog becomes a constant companion, a shadow, and that's what Arman decides to call her. But life becomes more dangerous by the moment. Eventually, Arman and Shadow find the courage to leave. But how far can Shadow lead them? And in this terrifying new world, is anywhere really safe? Okay, and that looks like um, there's probably something to do with Afghanistan with the soldiers, either the American or the English soldiers, and that looks like it could be Arman. And there's helicopters up there, so it's a bit of a war zone, perhaps, where this little boy lives. Does this dog rescue him away? I don't know. That shadow. Second one, Michael Morpurgo, born to run. Okay. For best mate, being rescued is the only start of his adventures. From an unwanted burden to a favourite companion, and from pet to champion race dog, this remarkable greyhound proves that it's not just cats who have more than one life. Cast aside, kidnapped, or living rough on the street, best mate can always find a way to survive. But will he ever find a real home? Okay. So it says the many lives of one incredible dog. So maybe it's a bit of an orphan dog wandering around and sometimes he gets looked after. Sometimes he perhaps doesn't get looked after very well. Does he find a, a, a forever home? So that's Born to Run. And the last one is Running Wild. Sorry, I was told the title there, Running Wild. For Will and his mother, going to Indonesia on holiday is a chance to put things behind them and have some fun. But then the elephant Will is riding on the beach begins acting strangely. That's when the tsunami comes crashing in and the elephant begins to run. Except that when the tsunami is gone, Will's elephant just keeps on running. Interesting. So, a story about a boy on holiday in Indonesia and, an, and a local elephant, which is called Running Wild. Or there was Born to Run, about the dog, maybe with no home, looking for its forever home. Or there was Shadow, about um, a dog that finds a young Afghan boy in Afghanistan, what we think, and um, can he help him get safe. So there's your three choices. So if you'd like to put the title of the one that you'd like me to read and the one that gets the most votes, we'll start. Shadow, Born to Run, Running Wild. Okay. Have a good weekend. We will start a new one on Monday.